Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tim Ottinger, Division Director for Government Relations for CHI St. Luke's Health. And before I introduce Dr. Ho, uh, I've been invited to talk a little bit about how today's topic of rising drug costs um, impacts our health system and essentially hospitals across the, the U.S. Um, St. Luke's is a diverse system ranging from a large academic medical center just around the corner to suburban hospitals all the way down to rural hospitals that are in tiny towns like uh, San Augustine, Texas, which is just east of Lufkin if you've ever been there. If you've ever been there, you had to go there because you don't pass through it on the way to any place else. Rising drug prices certainly impact the finance of hospitals. Um, sudden and large increases uh, especially on generic drugs or drugs that have been on the market for a while, uh, have a big, large impact on hospitals. We're required to absorb those, generally speaking, increases because CMS doesn't rebase or re-index their pharmaceutical pricing, but every five to seven years. So if something happens, we're, we're uh, paying the cost of that increase out of our pocket for hospitals for that period of time till it's rebased. And so sudden and small uh, increases even 10 or 20 percent on a widely used generic drug can have a huge impact on a hospital because that comes out of our cost uh, and we won't uh, regain that and that could mean millions of dollars a year to a large health system or a large hospital in terms of price increases that uh, we won't see. Um, the other impact beside hospital financing is on patients so uh, some of the, the pieces that you have seen when EpiPens went from $100 uh, for a pack to $600 for a pack, uh, people across the U.S. were thinking, how can I afford to, uh, that now to keep that on hand? So adults and children who are susceptible to those, those issues, when they had those issues, instead of having an injection that could easily resolve their problem, may wind up in the hospital and in a fairly serious condition. So it increases hospitalizations. At the same time, when uh, Daraprim went up from $13.50 a tablet to $750 a tablet overnight. There were patients that simply couldn't afford that, and those patients wound up, many of those patients wound up in the hospital. So there certainly is a practical impact on hospitals and health systems for rising drug prices. The CHI St. Luke's appreciates the Center for Health and Biosciences' rigorous research and their thoughtful discussion on health policy issues such as controlling drug prices. It's my privilege to introduce the Chair of Health Economics for Rice University's Baker Institute and the Director of the Center for Health and Biosciences, Dr. Vivian Ho. Thank you very much, Tim. And, and thank you all for coming uh, today for lunch and feel free to keep eating. Um, this is an interesting topic for me. As you know, during this luncheon, I've been giving updates annually about the Affordable Care Act. And while we had a very exciting summer last year around the law, I wasn't so sure that people wanted to hear again about, um, about all the issues. But we'll send a survey out after. And if you, you wanted to still hear about um, of all the excitement about going on, I'm happy to talk about that again at another time. I thought that talking about drug prices would be something that would attract a lot of people in terms of it's just been such a hot topic. I don't do research in the area of drug prices. So um, this was a big learning experience for me to come up with this talk, and, and, and I really enjoyed that. I, I just sort of took a fire hose up and, and sort of worked at this over the last, um, over the last month and um, have picked up a lot of information. I think there might be some people in the audience who are um, more knowledgeable on certain aspects of, um, of this topic than I am, and certainly uh, Dr. Hagop Kantarjian of MD Anderson, who is a non-resident fellow here who talks about cancer drug prices in his policy work, he certainly understands that area much better than I do, and I encourage you to read some of his material that, that's up on our website. But um, I, I enjoyed this, and I, and I hope you, you actually uh, learn something from what I've learned as well. So what I'm going to start with if I can get the clicker working. I would like to start. Which button worked? That one, yeah, thanks. So I, I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time 
talking about what's the problem. Um, say is and at some point you're going to look at some of these slides and wonder is there a problem and, and actually um, there is it's just a question of trying to define it and then of course being a policy institute we want to talk about policy options as well so I'll speak about legislation not legislation that has been passed but legislation that has been proposed by our policymakers about dealing with rising drug prices. I'll also um, talk about uh, expert rec recommendations from people who are uh, physicians, researchers, um, policy researchers like me. You'll see a lot of what they've come up with, and then we'll talk about what the Trump administration has actually proposed in terms of dealing with rising drug prices. They have acknowledged that um, clearly that this is a, a problem for all Americans and something that they would like to um, to attack. All right, so we'll, get, we'll begin with what we have in terms of overall not national health expenditures. So this is, uh, this is all expenditures, not just drugs, um, taken from uh, data from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And we'll start with the blue line here, which is national health expenditures. I'm starting with um, going by decade here, which is why you see this steep line. Once I get to 2000, I'm looking year by year. And I'm looking, uh, this is billions on this axis. And so what this is saying is um, projected numbers for 2018 are well over three and a half trillion dollars in healthcare expenditures in our country, probably one in every six dollars um, to be spent on healthcare uh, over time. And then um, I've got the, the, the change in the growth rate from the previous year graphed um, over here in the red line. And um, well, you might say, well, okay, it's kind of nice that this, this number is decreasing over time and we've got an increase here, which one would expect with the introduction of the Affordable Care Act, we covered more people with health insurance and when people have health insurance, they spend more money on health care, so expenditures have gone up. And um, while you may think that this is nice to see this decline, well, a good portion of it was actually due to the, re the, um, the recession we experienced. And the disconcerting thing is we've got the, the actual growth rates over here on this side. And you see, we're talking about a growth rate close to 6%, which is substantially higher than the growth rate we're seeing for the entire economy. And so this is the problem. We're spending much more on healthcare than we are on other sectors of our economy. And of course, this is unsustainable in the long run. Now I'm going to break the um, expenditures down by hospital care versus physician versus prescription drug use. And so um, what you've got, um, the blue and the red lines are hospital and physician expenditures, and they look fairly close to what you saw in the previous picture for total expenditures, all right? And um, the green line is the growth rate in prescription drug expenditures over time. And this looks terrific right here, very low growth rates in prescription drug expenditures. Um, but then as, as, as Tim mentioned to you, um, something we talked about that sort of, that, um, that, in, that sort of uh, caught people's eye and, and, and that we decided to make us uh, do this topic is, is the prices of EpiPen and, um, and Daraprim. Now, Daraprim only has one price point here because they did, they did their price crease, increase all in just one shot. It went from $7 and something cents to the $750 um, that you see there in, I think, September 2015. And EpiPen um, actually increased its price um, con continually. Um, until it reached that $600 right there. And so um, just wanted to show you where these drugs were in the midst of things, because some people think, well, was this just these two drugs? And I think this kind of shows you, um, and I have other slides to show you, that it was actually a number of different drugs that were driving um, these increases in expenditures. So this is, the, as you can see, is really quite a shock in terms of the increases in expenditures on these particular drugs over this time period. And yes, it goes back down to this low amount here, but the disconcerting thing is this, okay? And so um, the question is, is that type of pattern gonna continue and are there any policy options to try and um, deal with it? Um, another way to, to sort of look at is this a problem for the country is um, the Medicare trustees estimates um, for the future just came out um, earlier this week. And you can break down those um, estimates of cost increases 
um, by, uh, by particular category. Part D is the drug component. Um, part A is the inpatient, Part B is the physician. And while this is going to increase, you can see, there's still quite an increase expected here for, um, for prescription drugs that Medicare beneficiaries are, are spending and that it's going to um, be affecting our, um, our, our national budget. And, and it's, it's the hospital expenditures are the lowest growth rate, but that's actually, I think that was the component that the trustees predicted was gonna go, um, go bust in terms of going to a deficit in 2027 or something. something. Something before I'm ready to retire, which sort of gets me a little bit concerned. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the data another way. What this particular figure does is it shows you um, hospital, physician, and drug expenditures as a portion of all expenditures over time. And notice that these numbers are pretty flat, right? Okay, and so what this, what this uh, line at the bottom, if I looked at it, if this was the only slide that I looked at, it would say drug expenditures are 10% of all expenditures. And it's been pretty steady for a long time, even though we've seen those large um, blips in terms of changes. And so maybe we don't have a problem here. And you know, I, while I agree we should be we worrying about, about high, how high these are expenditures are, but we're not talking about them today, maybe there isn't something that we need to worry about here, okay? But now I'm gonna switch. I'm not talking about expenditures. Remember, spending is price times quantity. Let's take a closer look at price. And um, this, this slide I, I first came upon from the Drug Pricing Lab, and I'll talk more about them in a minute. Um, but they pulled this slide from a Wall Street Journal article that came out in um, 2015 about Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Do anybody remember the story about Valiant Pharmaceuticals? Okay. Um, uh, a company that uh, originally was doing absolutely wonderfully, um, but got into the strategy of dramatically increasing prices. These, this is a portfolio. These are four of their different drugs, all right? All that did very successful, um, but they were raising, Thalion was raising its, um, its, its, raising its profits by buying, um, for example, Nitropress in 2014. Um, price was well below $500 and raising it to $806 per vial, okay? Did the same thing, raise the price for Ofermev, Isoprel, and this other um, drug here, Vimovo, all right? Um, so it generated lots of stories um, that you can look up. Vanity Fair has a long article. Um, patients, as Tim was mentioning, they end up in, they end up in the hospital because they can't afford these medications or they end up worrying about um, whether they're even gonna be able to continue to live. Um, so, so that was another one of the companies that attracted a lot of attention. All right, so let's shift from one drug to what's going on with a large proportion of the drugs that people are taking. So this actually comes, believe it or not, from the AEA part, AARP Public Policy Institute, which I sort of was not that um, aware of, but I came across it in terms of recent, researching this topic. And the nice thing that they do when they're working on prescription drugs is they, they partner with a physician, I think his name is Stephen Schondelmeyer, and he heads a department at University of Minnesota. And he's very good at crunching numbers on drug prices. So they partnered together to come up with this particular report. Um, very detailed data from, I think it's United Healthcare and some of the large, l other large data sources in terms of prescription drug, drug claims. And so they're looking at the drug prices of 768 drugs here. And it turns out those drugs comprise, I believe, 83% of all drug expenditures in their data. So this is what's going on. With most, with most drugs that people take. And you can see the annual increases in prices over time. And here was that big shoot up, 12.5%, um, 11.1%. Um, in the most recent year that they had data available, it did go down to 6.4%. And then the red line here is the general inflation rate for the economy. So we, we can see it's, it's pretty darn clear that the prices for drugs have gone up substantially relative to the rate of inflation in the economy. All right, now this, this, this picture will also look a bit um, 
familiar to you, to you because you've got this, this, this blue line right here is the increases in generic prices, okay? Remember, before I was showing you generic spending. Now we're only looking at prices, but we've got that same spike up, and this actually ends in 2015, sort of before that other data series um, started having that, that shot up again. Um, but it, it pretty much shows you that when you break this down, and, and this, this gets broken down by, by brand name drugs versus generic drugs and things like that. But what I wanted to show you is, is, is how we've got this generic um, price increase as well that is driving things for the majority of drugs that people are taking. All right, so another way you can cut this is by looking at Medicare Part um, D. And so this report um, comes from the Minority Office, U.S. Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs, um, which, it, wow, if you're a real political buff, you'll know that this is um, the committee chaired by, um, by Senator McClask McCaskill from, from Missouri, who's um, sort of a, a, a big consumer advocate, particularly in terms of, of some of the, the pres prescription drug issues. So um, what she did is she's got the 20 most common, commonly prescribed Medicare Part D medicines. And you can have a look at some of these. Think if any of these are in your medicine cabinet. Okay, most prescribed, these are the ones that, um, yeah, it's sort of most prescribed in 2015. All right. And here, it's another table similar to that AARP, but it's, you know, it tells you the same story. The price increases for these drugs, substantially above the inflation rate in the country. Okay, so we get the same thing whether we're looking at United Healthcare data um, versus, versus Medicare Part D, data, Part D data. The prices are substantially higher. All right, so um, I know you're not going to be able to read this on the, unless, wow, you have, a, you have terrific uh, eye prescription or, or something like that. Um, so, uh, but what happened is this is a table you can find in their report which takes those 20 different drugs and they um, look at the change in prescriptions between 2012 and 2017, all right? So again, most, these are the ones that were most used in 2015. You want to look at the, the change in use over time. And uh, you may not be able to see it, but there are a lot of negatives here in front of these numbers. And once you take the, the weighted average, it turns out that the total drop in utilization is 33%. Okay, so there's been a substantial drop in utilization over this particular time period where we've seen substantial, substantial increases in prices. Now, some of you, you know, you're going to say, well, of course, some of these are brand name drugs that went off patent, so people stopped using the brand name versions and switched over to the generics. I did look through, I didn't look through all 20, and that's certainly the case, I believe. Let's see. Um, for Crestor, that is the case, and for Nexium, that is the case. However, there are others um, where I looked um, at Veridiscus. There does not seem to be a generic substitution on the market for that particular medication or Spiriva Handy Haler. Um, uh, so, so Adver, which I think I would think would be rather important um, for certain people to use, has had a 37% drop in utilization and. Um, Spiriva has had a 40% drop. And then even Tamiflu, I think Tamiflu had a generic that was introduced, but it was in September 2017. So there, um, that generic competition wouldn't have been enough to um, influence the utilization numbers here, and even that's a 35% drop. Okay, so this is the simple economics of what's going on in terms of drugs and access to drug and drug prices in the United States, that in 2012, we had lower prices and higher utilization. 2017, the prices have shot up dramatically, and because of that, we've moved upward on the demand curve and we have lower utilization. And so, so then the issue becomes, is this a problem? All right, um, so as I mentioned to you, um, I, I was lucky enough to be able to borrow some slides from Peter Bach. Um, who's at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He is a physician researcher who does a lot of wonderful research on drug prices. I encourage you to look at, um, just Google his name and look at his website. It's got, a, I can't even talk, he's got a drug price advocates there that's just terrific. And, um, and I don't have enough time to talk about that. But this is one of the, um, 
graphs that his group has generated. And um, it looks at new cancer drugs introduced um, over the decades um, and up until now. And you can see the prices of all these drugs are all these, are all these blue dots on this graph. And you can see this gradual mark, march upwards in the prices of the different drugs. And then um, you can also see the number of approvals along with this line. And so we've had increases in approvals, increases in prices. Um, of course, it's, it's lucrative to, um, to sell these drugs. And so drug makers, of course, are trying to introduce more of them. OK. And then he does this inter interesting um, contrast you'll see in a minute. And so um, Enbrel, of course, is, not a, is generally not a cancer drug. And, um, but Gleevec is. And what he's graphing along here are um, the prices for one week of treatment. And you see substantial increases, of course, um, uh, Enbrel, the increases, it looks slower, but the percentage increases are actually quite high up here just because you're starting from a lower base. So substantially, substantial increases in prices. And, and the reason why the increases in prices are so interesting is you would have thought, well, you're going to price according to the value of the drug and how much it helps patients. And you'd probably do that at the start when you first introduce the medication. But, you know, the point here is They've done that at the start, but then the prices still keep going up. And it's almost as if, well, if customers and we can get insurers and everybody else to pay for this, we'll just go ahead and keep on raising the price. And then you want to contrast that with what's happened with the price of the iPhone over time, um, which, which Peter also did. And you see, well, here we've got this tremendous technology here in the iPhone, but the price goes down, all right? And um, of course, Gleevec is going up, all right? And so, you know, I think of one of the messages that I hear um, drug makers say is, we need to keep increasing these prices because we need this to cover R&D to deliver new drugs to patients, okay? And this is, this is an important research question. There's not enough data for us, us to be able to figure out how much exactly do, we, um, do these drug companies need to spend on R&D? And, and, and I, I, I'm cautious about introducing regulation on that because I think if we force drug makers to come up with this information, they'd start padding R&D with all sorts of things, you know, and, and it's very hard to regulate. But I'll just point out, you know, it's, it's not as if Apple or, I, you know, Apple raises their price and says, we, you know, we need to raise those prices to develop more phones and, and better R&D. So, so why is it so special for pharmaceutical drug makers to be able to say this versus other types of makers of wonderful products, okay? Now, you may think that drug makers somehow have, somehow have fixed capital and fixed expertise, um, so they would be the ones best able to invest in new products. But my understanding of the pharmaceutical industry is a great many times it's a startup that comes up with the novel chemical entity, not the internal research division. Then the larger firm, pharmaceutical company buys that. Okay? So really what you have is, is companies that sort of have the most resources to be able to buy up the smaller companies and then be able to market and distribute these um, these products to, to very large markets. So, so, so that, I think, is really an issue up for debate in policy. Okay, this particular study um, that, that Peter pointed out is actually um, authored by David Howard, who we had to come, come speak here. He's a health, a health economist at Emory University. And um, what he did, um, along with his co-authors, is they were able to estimate the price per life year gained. So went through lots and lots of clinical studies and looked at particular drugs and looked at the estimated quality adjusted life years gained from each one of these drugs and compared that to the price. And what you see is an upward sloping line. So the amount that we have to pay um, in, in the United States for per improvement in quality adjusted life years has actually risen over time. It's more costly for us to buy the same health benefit than it was back um, a couple of decades ago. Okay, so um, what does this mean for patient access? Um, I don't know if you can read that, that title of this article that came out in Health Affairs, Cancer Drugs Provide Positive Value in Nine Different Countries. 
but the United States lags in health gains per dollar spent. And so in this particular study, they used OECD data and, um, and, and I think some other epidemiological data as well and looked at um, other developed countries. Uh, some of the other ones on this are France, the UK, Japan, um, Australia, Germany, Canada. And first what they're doing is measuring access. And the way they measure access is um, they're, uh, um, they're looking at the amount of spending on cancer drugs um, per estimated prevalence of each type of cancer in each country. Okay, and, and you see that the U.S. is in the bottom half right here in terms of the amount of spending on cancer drugs per prevalence. So, so, so it seems that Americans have less access, when they have cancer, they have less access to drugs to treat that cancer than in many other developed countries. And of course, we are the highest in terms of spending. Okay, another article again, um, uh, I borrowed this from, uh, from Peter Bach. It is looking at non-adherence. Um, so, so this is the percent of people in a survey done by the Commonwealth Fund that reported they, they, were, they were prescribed a drug by their physician, but they chose not to take it because of cost. And you see right here um, that the US is an outlier in terms of that we've got close to 17% of our are, are patients who choose not to take the amount of prescribed medicine because they cannot afford it, right? Substantially lower in many other countries. All right, so another nice um, section of Peter Bach's website is something called the, um, the Drug Policy um, uh, Lab Policy Tracker, okay? So let's move on to the policy issue. So um, you can look at this particular website at your at your own leisure. I just wanted to show you the general outline. This goes on for pages and pages and you can scroll through. Um, but for each, what they've done is they've tracked every single policy that's been introduced um, to, uh, in, in terms of uh, federal legislation. Okay, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. They've also looked at um, policy experts and what they have recommended. And for example, one of Dr. Contargian's recommend, recommendations is on this website. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's primarily what they've got here. Um, they don't have President Trump's recommendations up here yet just because they're so recent, but I'm, I'm sure they'll get them up soon. Okay, and so for each, each thing, you can look at the actual policy category. You can look at the solutions that um, were recommended because of this policy issue and then more details on the proposal. And then you look at what was the source. And, and you'll see this, I'm, you're gonna see this um, N-A-S-E-M come up quite a bit because I'm gonna pull some information from there. It's short for the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and I'll talk more about them in a minute. So, so that just shows you generally what the top of the website looks like. Okay, so um, we compress down what they had in terms of actual policy proposals um, right here. And uh, so, so this is only things that have been introduced into, um, into uh, the Senate or the House. Um, most of them actually came from the Senate, all right? Um, and I checked with Peter, I asked him if, if any of these had passed. None of these have passed, okay? But this is what our different policymakers are proposing in Congress. Um, you'll see uh, most of them are Democratic, um, in source, but there certainly are some, some re Republican proposals. And as you can see, it, it's quite a long list of different things that are being suggested. Of course, there are some things that are bipartisan, there are some things that, that only one side wants versus the other. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna try and go into more detail into some of these particular topics, but of course, um, we don't have enough time to go into all of them, and I think um, you probably don't want me to go into all of them either. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and, and look at some of these issues in detail. And the way I chose to do this um, was through the National Academy's report, okay? And, and the reason why, because I think it's quite interesting to sort of see that there is a fair amount of matchup between what the policymakers 
are proposing and trying to do on one hand, and then what the policy experts, the research experts are trying to do. There's a fair amount of overlap here, um, which is kind of encouraging. So this particular um, study, it's available on the web free of charge. I think it is. I got it through Rice. I don't know if you go through a non-Rice computer if it's, if it's free of charge, but I'm pretty sure it is. And um, this is a huge group of people who participated. National Academies, you know, sort of goes through and does a good job at trying to get experts. There are physicians here. There are representatives of the industry. There are people who've been doing research on drug prices for their entire career. So it's a real mishmash. One of the most entertaining things is actually to read the appendix because um, the final recommendations were not all agreed on. And so you see, you'll see one component sort of representing the pharmaceutical industry saying this, this, this whole thing has gone too far. And then you'll see some other um, physician researchers going, the report hasn't gone far enough. Um, so, so this is, I think, a fairly balanced perspective, what you see in terms of the main body of the report. OK, so um, National Academy's first recommendation, recommendation, the one they put front and center in the report, is to boost generic competition. And um, one of the things is to um, get rid of pay for delay, um, which I will talk about in just a minute. And another thing is to stop brand name drugs from their unfairly restricting access to samples of their medication that generics need in order to be able to develop a generic product. Okay? So um, pay for delay, uh, I don't have a full slide laying out the definition. Essentially, this is a practice in which um, we know a brand name drug gets patent protection for a certain number of years. After that, um, one generic can enter and compete with it, and, and, and they share the market for 180 days, and then after that, all other generics enter. Um, so there has become a practice. It's amazing to me that it wasn't a violation of antitrust laws, that the brand name drug would find the generic companies that were planning to enter and pay them part of their profits so that they wouldn't introduce their generic. And they just hold off doing it. This was quite common a few years ago. I checked. It's, it's not as common, but it is still happening. And, and I believe um, the FTC was trying to challenge this. But this just gives you, this is from a website. And this is just you know sort of four different um, drugs that I pulled from this particular um, uh, example of things going on. But you see, so that's why this is delayed until 2015. This practice has started quite a while ago. Um, but you know, you can see right here, you see the price of the brand name drug, and then you see what the potential price of a generic would be, all right? So $294 versus $73, that would be a substantial savings to the customer, and the customer is missing out on the generic because it's just not there, because the generic company was paid not to provide it, okay? Um, so quite extraordinary types of things that go on in this industry. The other thing I was mentioning about, about um, restricting access to drug, drug, um, drug samples, so the brand names just, um, it's kind of a crazy, it, it's some sort of, it, it results because some sort of federal um, safety rule are saying, well, you don't want to release these drugs because people could do things that are unsafe with them. It's like, well, you're letting patients use them. Why can't you let the generic drug firm have access to them? But um, that's the way it goes. Um, and so the person trying to change this is um, the man who's been put in charge of the FDA, Scott Gottlieb, who was formerly at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a physician. Um, and, and I think he's actually, in many ways, and, and he, he helped write Trump his, his drug, re drug recommendations, he's actually doing a lot of very sensible things. And, and this is one of them. He says, look, the problem is we don't have enough competition in this industry. We've got to get more generics. And he's working um, as hard as he can to get more generics to come out in the market and compete with these drugs to bring the prices down. So that, that, that's actually a, you know, a really good step in the right direction. And so here are some stories um, talking about the work that, that, that Dr. Gottlieb is trying to do. And then this just gives you an example. And so, so these are some of the drugs listed on their website. And so, for example, this says that Rambaxi got requests from five different generic, potential generic competitors for their, for Absor Absorica, for, you know, as samples. And they've managed to turn them back right now, and they're just sort of sitting on their, on, on their drugs and saying, no, we're not going to give access. So um, there are many, many more drug companies and um, different types of medicines and um, inquiries that are going on. So, so hopefully the, 
the barriers and sort of, you know, someone will be cutting the red tape on this and speed up this, this particular issue to get more generics out, out there on the market. And, and by the way, sort of the reason why this is becoming more of an issue now than it was many years ago is because a lot of the new drugs are biologics, okay? So these are, uh, I'm probably gonna get this wrong, um, but, but these sort of require sort of biological agents in them, which are extremely hard to duplicate. They're not like the good old fashioned medications where you could go in and sort of mix the chemicals together and you'd be all set, all right? And so it's very hard for the generics. They actually they really do have to have these samples. The science is much more difficult. And so that's what's making changing this industry relative to say 20 or 30 years ago. Okay. Another recommendation you'll see is let government be the purchaser. And so um, this text is taken straight from their report because prices tend to be lower when the purchaser has bargaining power that is at least as comparable to that of the seller. The United States could achieve lower prices for, for, for prescription drugs by consolidating bargaining power. And that's particularly, um, this has been said by uh, multiple different um, policy experts, David Cutler, who's, who's come and speaking here before, has said that he's a health economist at Harvard, um, to let Medicare go as one big body to the drug makers and negotiate a price. So currently under Medicare Part D, each one of the insurers that sells plans to, part, to Medicare beneficiaries negotiates their own price which eat with each drug manufacturer. But what would happen if you let them all come in as one group under the government, and the government says, okay, this is the price you're gonna get, and that's it, right? Um, now, there, there's more to this issue. There's an issue of which drugs would be required to be on the formulary and all that. Um, I totally agree, that, agree with that. But given the amount of time we have, um, you know, sort of how would I show you that this actually would work, okay? Other countries use a mix of negotiation and just, they're the single buyer, so they go in and tell the drug companies a price, or they, they don't buy the drug and it is not offered um, to their citizens. And um, so I'll show you some of the, the differences in prices that you get in other countries versus um, this one. And the thing you have to realize is the amount of lobbying, the extent of lobbying that the drug companies do in the United States is extraordinary. And there's no doubt that that is actually affecting um, the decisions on how the policymakers are reacting. Okay, so here's the differences in prices for all these other countries, all right, all right, relative to the United States. So, so the rest of the rest of the developing developed world pays 56% less than we do, right? Um, by having these governmental prices that go in and um, declare, well, this is what it's going to be. And, and we're actually having a conference coming up in the fall. We're gonna have experts come in and talk about the Canadian and French, um, no, Canadian, German, and, um, and the Taiwanese systems. And we're gonna talk about you know, everything. Um, there will be some discussion of drugs, but I'm sure there's gonna be a discussion of a lot of other things. But um, everyone else is getting a bargain compared to us. All right, so another thing that the National Academies recommends is price and cost transparency. So if you take um, any industry, this is generally kind of how things work. You have a producer who makes things, they give it to wholesalers who then distribute it to retailers and send it to the consumer, all right? It's a little bit different in healthcare because we are adding on um, health insurance in here as well. Not only that, the health insurance, even though it's chosen by the consumer, is actually often paid for. Um, most of the rich insur insurance policies are paid for by employers. So we can go ahead and put those two, two together. And these, these graphs are taken directly from the National Academy's publication. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've taken my, you know, distribution picture and I've, I've um, put in the patient, you know, and the health plan here and the employer, we've got the clinician. Oh, I'm gonna add in a pharmacy benefit man manager, okay? Um, and that's because the insurers, they can negotiate with all of the um, hospitals and physicians, but it just gets too hard to negotiate with all the places a consumer could get their medicines from. And so they just hand that over to pharmacy benefit managers, um, Express Scripts, you, you, you know, all the, probably seen the big ones in the paper. And then, oh gosh, what is this over here? Rebate, rebate, rebate. Okay, so 
at every single step along the way, there are things that are not really the price. There is a price, for example, that the, the, you know, the health plan pays to the pharmacy benefit manager for each drug, but they get a rebate. And then there's a price that the pharmacy benefit manager pays the manufacturer for the drugs that they're gonna sell and hand over to the customer, but then there's a rebate going on here. We have no information on these rebates. So it's extremely hard for us to figure out what on earth is going on? And so how can you have price transparency if you don't know where, if you can't follow the money? Oh, and let's just add one more thing in here. <laughs> advertising, all right? And we very much, you know, there are plenty of studies that show that advertising is extremely effective at getting patients in to go see the doctor. That's why we're, you know, we suffer through so many ads when you're watching Fox or CNN news on these various different prescription drugs because they work, all right? And, and clinicians will often just do what the patient asks them to do in terms of a prescription that they've seen advertised simply because they're worried about losing the patient as a customer. So they're not necessarily thinking in terms of the benefits of what's best for the customer, but, oh, the customer has insurance anyways. They're not going to pay for it, so I'll just go ahead and give it to them. All right, so, so we've got that added in. And so um, this um, is, is kind of an interesting graph. This is also from the National Academies, and it's just trying to get their point across about price transparency. This is um, uh, Niraj Sood, who also came and spoke at the Baker Institute, has done this table or this figure, um, and it's his best possible approximation of where does the money go, okay? But caveats in here, this is from publicly traded companies. Um, it's really hard to figure out how much the pharmacy benefit manager is making and, and all these different things. But it basically says, suppose you had $100 um, uh, in, in drug spending, $17 of that is actually um, the production costs of the drug, okay? And then um, this is this is sort of a, you know a, a tough tough thing to interpret. But but then he's saying you know forty one dollars then goes to the manufacturer um, uh, in terms of about you know sort of the profit that they're keeping. And then he goes on and shows the different amounts that go to each particular intermediary in between. So he's saying actually um, you know that uh, a particular amount. Um, $3 goes to the insurer, $5 goes to the pharmacy benefit manager, the pharmacy keeps um, a particular amount of dollars as well. The overall point of this is that of the $100, $41 actually goes to all these intermediaries, okay, and not, not, not for the makers of the drugs, okay, and, and then the $41 because the reason why I'm talking about this is because some people have said, oh, the reason why drug prices are going up is all because of the pharmacy benefit managers. That the drug companies aren't collecting anything. It's all going to all these intermediaries. And this, what this report does, it says, well, $41, goes to, $41 goes to all the intermediaries. And then it compares that number to other countries. And in other countries, it's $32. Okay, so what that is saying is that yes, we have more money going to intermediaries, but there's still plenty of money going to the drug companies. And no one should assume that they're actually um, getting dramatically hurt by this, that there, there are still very rich profits to be made by drug companies. Okay, just another example. This is a much smaller example, um, but one that just came out, I believe, um, yeah, just recently. Um, and this is, um, Kaiser Health News did this particular story in terms of transparency for um, if you have Medicare Part D plans and you go to your pharmacist, um, you should ask them if you're picking up the drug, would it be cheaper to pay for it in cash, all right? They cannot volunteer this information to you, but if you ask, they will tell you, okay? and. Um, uh, this, this is another group of researchers out of the University of Southern California. So they had a very large data, database. I think they, this was United Healthcare as well. And they, they looked through close to 10 million claims, all right? And, and, and what this is, is the, the amount, the average amount um, that insurers, insurees paid for their medications over what the cash price would have been. Um, 
if they had just bought these in for cash and and, and they compared using sort of um, sort of list list prices for medications that they could get from another source. So in general, there's a fa fair amount of overpayment by Medicare beneficiaries. Again, because of the numbers, oh, may not be so may not be so bad, but this really adds up when you've got a lot of seniors who are really at the margin in terms of being able to cover their expenses um, at retirement. Okay, uh, the Orphan Drug Act, something that you might not hear much about. Um, uh, this, this, was a, this was an act that was passed maybe, what, close to three decades ago? And, and what this was meant, the policy was meant to encourage drug makers to develop drugs for rare diseases, all right? Because otherwise there wouldn't be enough economic incentive if there wasn't a market out there of people willing to buy these particular drugs. And the advantages, if you produce a drug that gets defined as an orphan drug, is you get seven additional years of patent protection, you get an expedited regu regulatory review process, you don't have to have as many patients in your trials as normal drugs, you get tax credits for um, your drug testing, and then you're allowed to charge higher prices because supposedly you know, these drug companies need to recover their costs. However, um, Drug companies have been very clever about defining what drugs count as orphan drugs, okay? Um, so the orphan drug um, status you get for a particular set of patients that you define um, to the FDA. And so an example, probably one of the biggest examples of rituximab that was approved for lymphoma, but then, oh goodness, after it got the orphan drug status and all the tax credits and everything else, suddenly it could be used for all these other different types of um, cancer-related illnesses, and rheumatoid arthritis and skin disorders. So suddenly you're marketing to a much bigger market, but you got all these protections in terms of patent extensions. And I didn't realize this. So these three drugs, Vioxx, Cialis, and Botox, which I'm sure you've all heard of, all were developed under the Orphan Drug Act, which, which really leaves you scratching your head, all right? And then, so, you know, they're, they're, some drugs have received multiple orphan drug act de, um, designations, Gleevec being one of them, that had $3.3 billion in sales in 2016. Okay, and so what did I, I mentioned lobbying um, before to you, and um, this is uh, data from 2017, the top lobbying in industries in the United States, pharmaceuticals is right at the top, okay? Um, $280 million in lobbying expenditures. Um, insurance is, is, is quite up there, but, um, but not, not um, even close. Um, Tim, this is your problem. You're only halfway down the list. You need to spend more on, on lobbying. And so, so this is the influence that, that has affected what the policymakers are proposing. Okay, so I wanted to say something um, briefly about, about President Trump's um, report. It's a 40-page report that came out just recently in his proposals in terms of controlling drug prices. Um, again, you can find this on the web. They say the four major challenges are high list prices for drugs, um, seniors and government programs are overpaying for drugs because they lack um, the negotiation tools that are necessary, high and rising out-of-pocket costs for customers, and foreign governments are free riding off of American investment and innovation. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so the, the top three, I think we can all agree, right? And, and, and the fourth, I would just reword. Um, I, I understand the intent behind that. Um, but, but the actual proposal to sort of say, we're just gonna tell all the foreign countries that they need to pay more for their drugs and so this will solve the problem. Well, the drug companies would be happy to do that and raise all those prices, but that doesn't mean there's any economic incentive for them, therefore, to reduce the prices here in the United States. It, it just doesn't work that way in terms of profit maximization. Okay, so the strategies that are proposed, this, again, was all authored um, in cooperation with Scott Gottlieb and um, Secretary Azar at Health and Human Services. There are a lot of sensible proposals in this report. I will say, though, a lot of them are not necessarily things that are going to be acted on immediately. Some are, um, but a lot of this is sort of discussions. Let's have a discussion. So a lot of the things are, are phrased in terms of questions. Should we have drug companies do this? Should we have the insurance companies do that? And sort of asking for feedback. And, and I almost felt in some of the things, I should have put an example, some of the things were very cerebral. Um, 
and, and so you can tell, you know, so Secretary Azar, um, Dr. Gottlieb are very smart people, all right? But it almost sort of got really down into the weeds in some of these policies. So, so, so this is, is sort of two different, two different sort of minds going on in this particular report at the same time. So they want to improve competition, have better negotiation incentives for lower list prices and lowering out-of-pocket costs. All right. Um, so some examples, lots of things proposed, as I mentioned in this report. Um, well, the first one we discussed, and so this is where they, do, they agree with the policy experts. You stop brand name drugs from restricting access to samples needed by generic drug makers. Okay. Um, they're gonna ex they want to experiment with value-based purchasing in federal programs. Um, that's something I didn't have time to fit into the talk. It is just what it says. It's, it's coming up with agreements where you only pay drug manufacturers when their drug works on a particular patient, and then you don't pay for the drug if it doesn't work. And then this, this works in, in terms of um, specific biologics, things that are very, very expensive. Um, this is something that the policy experts have promoted as well. Okay, and I, I believe probably MD Anderson's um, experimenting with some of these as well and probably talking with some insurers about value-based contracts. Um, you require manufacturers to include the list prices in advertising. Um, that is something that they've actually put. You, you probably have seen that listed in the paper and sort of people were talking about, well, I don't know if this is going to have an effect. I think it's a good idea. Um, we don't know exactly how it's going to work and how it's going to play out in, in customers' minds, but, but it's good to see the price and, and to sort of see how people will think about that. And prohibiting gag clauses from insurer pharmacist contracts. So allow the pharmacist to give all the information they have in terms of available generics and what the price would be if, if the patient paid cash. What's missing from the Trump plan is letting the, gov the government negotiate prices for Medicare. And, and what's so fascinating about that is that when President Trump was on the campaign trail, this is something he said he wanted to have happen. And then it's actually missing from this plan. And then you start wondering, well, which of the drug companies went up and talked with him um, and all that money spent on lobbying, how did that actually uh, influence this decision to leave this out of this jam-packed report? Um, the other thing that's missing, which I think um, it's not clear, I, I haven't completely come up with my, my feelings about this, but importation of drugs from other countries, that is something that many people on the Democratic side are pushing for. Um, I think you could have a limited amount of this working, but you don't want to have you know, a free-for-all in terms of um, importation of drugs, but there's certainly um, that needs to be considered. All right, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So um, just to wrap this up, um, it's clearly these rising drug prices are a threat to affordability of access to health care. They're already affecting many different patients. And because they're so costly, they raise the price of insurance plans, and so they make insurance plans uh, more difficult to afford. There's lots of different policy options out there and lots of good policy options that have not been acted on yet that, that should um, actually take effect. Um, and, and I'll just say it as, as an aside, um, there will be drug manufacturers who say, oh, but these are going to discourage innovation. I don't think there's really much evidence of that being the case, okay? And um, it's pretty clear to me that lobbying by drug companies is preventing forceful policy action, and, and that's going to be a difficult thing to overcome. So um, with that, I'd like to open up to questions, comments, um, and maybe some, for some of the questions I can't answer, maybe there are experts in the, audi on the audience who can help me answer um, some of these questions as well. So I was at um, a talk that the Federal Reserve put on, and they had Peter Orsak speaking, who had been Obama's um, OMB director. And he said that the ability for Medicare to negotiate drug prices doesn't have the full benefit that people think it does. And he explained, and I 
didn't catch it. And I'm wondering if when you were doing your research, if you came across any of the arguments that are put forth um, that might support that. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. If you look at this sort of issue of negotiation and you Google and, and then you get to a CBO report, Congressional Budget Office, it actually claims that there would be almost no savings from negotiating um, uh, Medicare Part D prices. However, a lot of that has to do with how the formularies are currently structured. So the way the formularies are now, they say for all of the following categories, you have to have two different drugs or you know and so it's the way we structure the formulary so 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 that the government it says well i have to, i have to buy this drug because i have to have two in this category other countries don't do that so that's why i'm saying you know it's not so simple but it's do you trust that cbo report or do you trust the other companies that have all the same drugs that we're using we're using but for almost half the price i'm going to go with other countries who are going to able to get it to work and yes, we'll have to redo the formularies, and yes, there may be some alternatives that certain patients are going to miss out on, but I'll take the cost savings. Yeah, so, you know, I'm sure it's more, more complicated than that and that there are some other issues, but if that's the, the case, then we redo the legislation and the requirements the way we structure Medicare Part D rather than give up on it. So, first of all, thank you very much. It, it was a great presentation and it Thank encapsulates you. a lot of information. One of the slides that fascinated me was it showed about a nine or ten year increase on a drug as the cost goes up, up, up. And it starts slow, ends up high. One of the things I was wondering about or would like to see in the future is whether that correlates with the time that it's under patent protection so that they are squeezing as much profit out as they can before the drug drops with generic pricing. And I've not seen that anywhere, but it's not, I, I often think it's not so much for the R&D, is that they're going to relinquish those large profits once they lose patent protection. So if that's something you're gonna look at for another presentation, I'd like to see it in the future. If yeah, that, that, that's an excellent comment, and I should look to see if I have graphs, because the academics know that. That is in academic journals, that the price actually goes up um, just before the drug goes off patent. You then shrink the customer base to those who are, have the most inelastic demand who aren't willing to switch, and then you make your money off of them. Um, but that, again, is slowing down because of this pay for delay. You know, they're finding, well, I don't really have to let this go off patent and open it up to the entire market yet. So, so I, th I, think, I think those papers I've seen are really old. And so the question is whether someone had the data to update that and see whether it's still going on. I, too, congratulate you on a superb Thank presentation. You. I purchased a very expensive drug online from a Canadian pharmacy where there is a, an active competitive world of lots of Canadian pharmacies that I price compete. Could you explain what the limitation on importation is and how am I breaking the law by getting around it? We're not recording that, are we? Um, Okay, again, this is not my, my field of research. I think it is breaking the law. On the other hand, I also have seen plenty of cases where it is done. So you've got lots and lots of company. You've got companies that take busloads of people from Vermont across the border um, to pick up their medications. And, um, and you know, we, we, I think there was, under the Bush administration, there was even some discussion of sort of legalizing this more. The government doesn't have the resources to track you down. Um, I, you know, they're, they're too busy sort of chasing other people down. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the FDA, I think, has a legitimate concern in terms of safety. Um, but I, you know, I'm like you, I, I trust Canadian pharmacists. You know, I, I think what you did was a sensible thing to do for a very expensive drug. Um, the, the concern is, well, what happens when you start buying these drugs from developing countries? And then there's all sorts of issues of safety. But, um, 
Yeah, I, you know, the interesting thing is what happens if a bunch of different consumer activist groups do what you do, but in, in a more organized manner? I don't know what will happen in terms of enforcement. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the drug companies that pay to the generics to delay their introduction? A little bit of the, you know, what goes behind closed doors and how the legality of doing that. I, yeah, I wish, I wish I could give you more detail, but, but, you know, I think in a way a lot, of, a lot of the agreements are still confidential because it is a private contract between two different companies. So, um, you know, the FT, FTC and DOJ do try and challenge us whenever, whenever they can, but pretty much they're, you know, there aren't any set rules. They just go, the, the, the brand name drug company figures out which generics are close and then, and then figures out, well, this is how much money I can make if I continue as a monopoly, and so I'll give this portion of those profits to, to the generic drug makers or one or more of them to keep it off market. And, and as you can see by, by the tables, they can keep these off market for a long time. It just, it depends on the number of potential competitors, and it's gonna be more likely, as I, as I mentioned, as we have spe specialty drugs, biologic drugs, so there are fewer potential competitors, it's easier to do this, although the federal government is trying to crack down on it, but it, it still goes on. Uh, yes, have you done any studies into the comparisons of the plans offered by the insurance company to the consumers related to the classification of tier drug, tier one, tier two, uh, and then of course the amount you pay in, the donut hole. Have you done anything on, on those studies and how they affect the pricing? Um, I have not, um, but in terms, of, in terms of the tier drugs, um, there have been studies from a long, from a long time ago that, that show that once you introduce tiered pricing, you lower overall expenditures on drugs, um, you know, sort of employer-based plans. The employees spend less in response to them. Um, you do sometimes end up with unintended consequences that once you introduce the tier, a patient forgoes a particular drug that they should have taken and then ends up needing more physician visits. But that is not always the case. In terms of the donut hole, I think, you know, things are still changing so rapidly. I know there are researchers trying to look at that, um, but um, in terms of what's happening right now, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of um, unfortunate stories that are showing up in the newspaper about people who can't, have, you know, who are on a limited budget in retirement and can't afford to pay the donut hole part, and then they can't pay, afford to pay the 5% um, beyond that, once they pass the donut hole, and 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 that was mentioned in the in the Trump report. So so they are talking about ways to get rid of 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 that five percent and um, and help retirees pay for these, for these. But I have to remind you, every time you get rid of that five percent, every time you get rid of that copay, that removes the incentive for. So the, the patient to restrict their utilization of the drug, and that's just going to increase expenditures even more. Um, so it's, it's a tough issue to address. So I saw on one of your slides, and you didn't speak to it, the 340B drug program, which is supposed to be a program that allows safety net providers to have lower pricing and use those drugs with their patients. There seems to be a fair amount of agitation for uh, there needing to be massive change in that program. Did you find any real evidence of that program being abused and, and in, in need of significant uh, adjustment? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I didn't get to go into, I didn't have enough time to sort of go into that thoroughly. My impression from the newspaper articles is there is a fair amount of abuse. Um, and so we have to figure out how to, how to ratchet back that program without hurting the truly safety net hospitals. I think the bigger issue for me is, is we make that, that price advantage, you know, so, 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 so um, for those of you who, have heard, who haven't heard of this particular legislation, it, it allows hospitals that ca take care of vulnerable populations to purchase many drugs um, at a discount relative to what our hospitals are paying, but suddenly, you know, all the hospitals are getting into it. The problem is it gives hospitals the discount, but it doesn't, doesn't give physicians the discount. And so physicians in order to, and, and the hospitals realize this, so they say they go ahead and they acquire the physician groups, 
all right? And so, so then the physician groups can bill at the higher price, but the problem with that is physicians who are billing under a hospital are also billing higher amounts because they can charge the um, Medicare a facility fee, which adds on several hundred dollars. And to me, that's the larger problem with that program. Um, because it's encouraging physician-hospital integration that doesn't necessarily benefit the patient and is actually raising costs for everybody. Thanks for the talk, Vivian, full of good information as always. So when uh, Peter Bach spoke at Baylor College of Medicine last year, he really focused on drug pricing for cancer indications. And one of the things he's published on are simple things like packaging. So, for example, in one case, a cancer company put a uh, drug in an oversized ampule, charged that ampule, and then, of course, you didn't need all of the drug to administer. Um, and then EpiPen also, I recall reading something where they changed the expiry dates so that people would have to buy more frequently. So do you know what prevalence this is in the drug industry, these sort of um, kind of marketing, packaging sort of um, strategies that, that companies use and whether there's FDA oversight for these sorts of things? Yeah, that's a really interesting question and I don't have data on that. Um, but, but we should both pass that on to Peter and say, hey, um, can you figure out a way to track this as well? Um, because, you know, it's one thing to track things through anecdotal stories in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, but I'm just wondering if there is another way to, um, to measure that. And it's, it's an excellent point. And, you know, it, it's, it, that's not even influencing really the patient. It's influencing providers because it's, it's the hospital that's buying these things, right? Yeah. Yeah, once again, thanks for uh, an always informative presentation. Uh, my question is around the international um, price differ difference uh, in drugs. Uh, I'm thinking from a correlation standpoint, so you have auto manufacturers, you have Japanese auto manufacturers that sell in the US, Europeans too, we like the quality, we'll buy them. The drugs that are being sold, say in Canada or in Europe, at different prices, are these by competing firms that could come establish uh, their operations in America, given the, the, the opportunity for them to, to, to make more money, or are, are these the same Pfizer and global companies that are selling at different prices in all these other countries? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that 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 that's a good question, and I'm glad you asked it. So the figure I probably didn't have enough detail. Those price differentials were for the same drug sold by the same company. So it wasn't as if they're sort of buying from from lower quality makers of these drugs. These really are the differences in prices. And I was trying to come up with a cool graph to sort of illustrate what's going on, and, and it just, uh, uh, maybe I'll eventually figure out how to do it. But essentially what's going on is something called price discrimination. And this one, this happens whenever a monopolist is able to segment markets and keep, um, for example, keep Americans from buying um, drugs from Canada, okay? So what that allows them to do is take every single demand curve and price according to how inelastic the demand curve is in that country. And so that, um, that demand curve is fairly elastic in other countries because they've used the government to keep, that, keep it that way. We've just ceded you know, authority to the drug companies. And, and I kind of think that what has happened is we sort of started out with a fairly elastic um, demand curve, but we now have two different proportions of the population, those people who don't have much money and those people who actually have very generous employer-provided health insurance. And um, I think the, the pharmaceutical companies have said, let's forget the people who have demand, who have elastic demand, and let's focus on the inelastic market, which is going to generate much more profits for us. And so they're only marketing to that, that group. And, you know, it's sort of when you draw out the, you know, the, the marginal cost curve and things like that, you find that they can maximize profits just by focusing on, on that market. And that's what they're doing. And we're letting them do it. 
Uh, my name is Susanna Kuntz, and I'm the immediate past president of the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association. And to speak to the gentleman's question earlier, um, during my presidency, one of the initiatives I had was a policy summit about drug waste. And so as some of you know, Dr. Bach did publish that paper in the March 2016 BMJ, where he looked at drug waste, and he took the top 20 cancer drugs in America and estimated that we throw away or waste about $3 billion every year because of these oversized packaging or these single dose files. So our association is actually trying to address the issues and we're looking at this more deeply. We're in the process of coming up with a white paper on this based on the proceedings that we had last May with the group and actually Dr. Bach was the keynote speaker and he helped start the conversation. So we can't, we, we, we haven't been able to solve everything, but we think we have some pretty good viable solutions relating to repackaging the products, extending the stability so we can extend the expiration date, and we're not having to toss these products in the garbage like we're doing now. Thank you for that comment. That's very interesting. Thanks so much, Dr. Ho. Um, I have one uh, comment. Um, uh, for the gentleman who uh, raised the question about pay for delay and, um, and a question for you. Um, so the comment um, on pay for delay, having spent um, some of a prior life um, it, undertaking enforcement around um, these types of uh, arrangements between um, brand name and generic companies, there are outstanding lawsuits and have been for sort of 15 years at both the federal um, and state level by antitrust authorities. Part of, I think, the tension is the pace of change when things have to go through the courts and they're litigated just on the facts of a particular case. So um, there was a sort of a positive case for consumers, you know, up to a decade ago um, that essentially said that, look, if it's a cash payment, because those were the facts of that case, between uh, the, the uh, manufacturer and the uh, generic, the, the brand name and the generic, that, you know, that, that clearly was anti-competitive. But then what took almost a, another decade to litigate is if there was some sort of in-kind exchange between those two companies, whether that would also fall under, you know, these very nuanced laws that weren't drafted originally. Um, with these types of industry practices in mind. So I think part of the tension is there is there is a wave and um, advocacy around sort of settling it once and for all through legislation and making clear that kind of a range of variations on the same theme are um, anti-competitive or you know anti-consumer. Um, what we've also seen is a lot more what this gentleman um, raised, which is um, a new variation of the same drug with a real clinical benefit. Like instead of four injections a week, just one injection. Um, but there, I think I've seen some data out there that tracks the prevalence of that, and the one injection a week, you know, comes out sort of six months before the patent expires, and this can happen um, with a lot of drugs, and it's a lot harder to show whether the timing of that is coincidental um, or more uh, sort of strategic. Dr. Ho was wondering when you had a slide that looked at um, brand versus specialty versus generic proportion. Um, all of these different types of markets contributing to rising drug costs, whether you came across um, any research that suggested kind of one ecosystem versus another was more responsible for recent increases. I've just heard that there has been some sort of finger pointing within the industry where generics will point out, actually we've been a part of the solution pre the Screlly examples um, in being a cost reducer overall, um, but I just haven't seen the numbers, you know, sort of, is there a difference in the proportional role that the different sub-markets have played in yeah. rising costs? Yeah, yeah, interesting question. And, 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 and thank you so much for your legal comments. This is why we uh, invited Karen Zung to be a, a non-resident scholar at the Baker Institute. She's also um, joined Harris Health. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting question. My understanding, what I should do is take that graph which was only prices and see if they have the information on utilization and then look at percentages and expenditures by the different categories. Um, yeah, so I, my impression is the finger pointing is all going at the specialty drugs, um, right? And, and that could be the case simply because they're so much more costly to produce. And so if they all have larger prices, that is going to drive 
a lot of the uh, a lot of the the expenses. But on the other hand, I'm just saying, well, that's just because they're more expensive. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are more um, uh, more evil than the others, because it, it certainly seems like the other drugs, which are not biologics, are kind of doing the same thing. So I I think there's plenty of blame to go around in terms of the behavior. The impact of cost depends on you know the unit price of each one of these things, and some are just generally very expensive. I think we can take one or maybe one or one more question, and then and then oh. others feel free to come up and, and talk with me after. Uh, just two little questions. In your graph where you talked about the cost of hospitals, drugs, and doctors, it only added up to like 60%. Where's the other 30% of the cost? And another um, another question I had is when the, 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 the prices increased in 13 and 14, do you think that was the pharmaceutical companies realizing that more people were gonna have health insurance and they took advantage of that because the drug companies are just, uh, it's ridiculous how they raise prices. If you ever did an analysis of actual, cons uh, rev of their revenues and how much was due to price increases and how much it was due to volume, if anybody ever did that study, I think it would be shocking how much of their increase in revenues is due to price increases, which is just on no other, no other industry in, in the country or the world can even do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, those 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 three categories: hospital, physician, and drugs. They are. I think. I don't think there's thirty percent left. There is there there is stuff left over. A good portion of that, um, my guess, is nursing home care and home home health care expenditures. Um, but um, you you ha there are various other different categories running around here. But that that's probably um, one of the largest ones. That's an interesting point you raise. Um, I can try and figure out how to do that. The problem is this um, comparing apples and oranges. So, so how do you do this when the quantities of all the medications differ? Um, but surely there must be a way to. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'll have to think, because that, that would be a nice thing to add, add to the slide deck. Um, so, so I want to make sure that everyone um, who needs to get out of here has, has time to get, to get out of here. And, and, and I appreciate the comments and the feedback. Um, you know, please feel free to email me afterward um, uh, if there's things that still bother you. Thank you again for coming. Um, we're, we're grateful for your support. We're very ex uh, ex also extra grateful to the support of the Health Policy Forum members who make events like this happen. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at another event. Thank you.